Okay, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the break. I uh, hope you had a chance to visit the booth. We're going to move right along into this uh, second portion of the show today. Dr. Eichelberger, who's talking next? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this uh, next section is going to, do, uh, going to deal directly with uh, head injuries and try to update everybody as to where we are on, and what the controversies are about head, uh, handling head injuries, which is a major problem that children have. Uh, we had uh, Dr. Uh, Mike Bell, who was to give a presentation. Uh, unfortunately, he's in Brussels and had some internet uh, issues. And David uh, Shellington, Dr. Shellington, has, uh, was one of his fellows, a good close colleague, has decided to and, and offered to go ahead and do the presentation. So thank you so very much, Dr. Shellington, who is Assistant Professor of Pediatrics in San Diego and is also uh, the Director of Research. Uh, David, thank you for coming back. <laughs> no, no problem. Thank you very much. I, I hope I don't scare your audience away by presenting twice back to back. Um, so, Mike, this is, I'm going to be presenting some uh, slides from that Mike originally had uh, designed and I modified a little bit just to bring it down to my level um, and, and make it a little bit more practical. Uh, Mike eats and breathes traumatic brain injury, so I'll try to do it justice. Um, that is a picture, picture of P Pittsburgh where I trained and where Mike currently works, although, he's, as uh, Dr. Eichelberger said, he's in Brussels. Um, I'm going to review very briefly the epidemiology of pediatric traumatic brain injury, talk about a little bit of the physiology and how it guides our uh, resuscitation and management of these patients. And then I'm going to spend a, a good portion of the time talking about the challenges to the field in this area of patient management and close with some new concepts. So from the CDC, uh, there are about 52,000 deaths annually resulting from 1.7 million traumatic brain injuries, which are estimated to occur in the United States annually. So this is a huge medical and public health problem. Of those 52,000 deaths, slightly over 7,000 of them occur in children. And even in the children that survive, about 50% of kids go on to have terrible outcomes. And so this is an area where we really need to work on Im improving our management of these patients. And it, as you can see across the, the young age groups, this is a, a, a terrific problem. Um, as, as, kids get, as kids turn into young adults, the, um, the frequency of emergency department visits and hospitalizations may decrease uh, per capita, but it's, it's, a, it's a huge issue in the population that we're going to talk about this morning. So the, the, the basic principle of all of our TBI management focuses on the fact that you have the skull, which is essentially a fixed bony structure, and then within that fixed skull, you have brain, blood, and spinal fluid. And for those of you who are uh, facile with the, the literature, um, this is the Monroe Kelly Doctrine. And essentially, um, over a, a certain volume of extra mass or edema, the brain is able to use compensatory mechanisms in order to maintain a constant ICP, but then it's some point, these mechanisms fail as the mass or edema expands and resulting in intracranial hypertension. And we think that this is probably the, the locus of uh, a lot of the problems that occur um, with these patients. The Pittsburgh Protocol for Pediatric TBI um, is, is it, it's something to read later on when you have time, and I'm just going to try to distill it out for those of you in the audience. Um, but over the course of this lecture, we're going to talk about what is the evidence for the, the Pittsburgh Protocol and, and the guidelines that we use for traumatic brain injury. There was a recent release of the, the second edition of the guidelines of acute medical management for severe TBI in infants, children, and adolescents. To, uh, it basically looked at any studies that were published in children who were affected by a GCS of less than nine, so that's eight and below, an age of le less than 18 years of age, and the studies had to look at some relevant health outcome. And of course, they had three levels of recommendations. Class one was a, a must be done recommendation. Class two was a should be considered recommendation. And class three was a may be considered recommendation. Um, the, the one notable thing about the second edition of these guidelines is that the requirements to meet each level of recommendation were more stringent than in the first edition. And so some of our class one recommendations fell to class two or class three recommendations in the second edition. From 4,983 4, abstracts, 605 manuscripts, only 37 met the uh, rigor required to be included in the guideline, and that essentially left us with no level one recommendations. And so essentially every, everything that I'm going to offer today are suggestions, um, which can lead to a lot of debate and discussion, but by no means am I preaching any, any one right way to manage traumatic brain injury. 
the level two evidence um, included avoiding hyposter excuse me avoiding steroids, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on in the presentation. Actually, avoiding hypothermia, which was one of our most promising therapies, but a lot of uh, new evidence has cast doubt on the effectiveness of this. Um, not using an immune enhanced diet, which doesn't really seem to do have any effect, and then uh, three percent saline uh, may be the choice of fluids for intracranial hypertension. But I think there's some some debate that can occur there as well. The level three recommendations include pretty much any other treatment of traumatic brain injury that you can imagine. ICP monitoring, what threshold to use for intracranial hypertension treatment, where to put, where, where to target your cerebral perfusion pressure, whether to use 40 or 40 to 50. There were, there were articles supporting both of those. Um, how much neuromonitoring to do, the role of Lycox monitors or brain tissue oxygenation monitors. Um, obviously, I think most of us would agree that neuroimaging should probably be a, a first line recommendation but based on the evidence we have available, it's technically a tier three. Um, and then looking at cerebrospinal fluid drainage, which again is one of our mainstays of therapy, there's not a lot of level one quality evidence out there to support doing it versus not doing it. Um, I think most of the audience is probably familiar with the CRASH trial, which, looked, which was an, an adult study that looked at um, corticosteroids in the setting of traumatic brain injury. And the, the only reason why I bring this up is that in a, in a large adult trial, corticosteroids were associated with a higher risk of mortality in the brain injured population. And, and it didn't really look at why that is, but it, it uh, gives us some guidance that maybe corticosteroids are not the right treatment to put on these patients, where, where I too often and find that corticosteroids do get given to these patients is at the time of extubation. And unfortunately, the, the airway doesn't realize that you're given the steroids for the airway and not the brain. Um, so that can be a little bit of a problem. Um, Hypothermia, I think, again, this is a very well-published, well-publicized well study um, from, a, from the Canadian Research Group, the head, in, head Injury Trial Investigators in the Canadian Critical Care Trials Group. And um, they looked at hypothermia of 32 to 33 degrees centigrade, applied for 24 hours, starting within eight hours of after brain injury. And I think a lot of us expected, um, based on our experience, that this was going to reduce poor outcomes at a six-month time frame, six-month neurocognitive evaluation. And essentially what we found that was there was no benefit. And in fact, uh, there was a um, survival curve that showed that hypothermia application might actually be harmful in traumatic brain injury. And I, I, I don't think that surprises anybody who's familiar with damage control resuscitation because hypothermia is obviously one of the problems we're trying to combat. But it, it, it is very difficult to use this as a therapy in the setting of the severely injured patient. The one thing that the Canadian trial did shed light on is that our brain injury studies, even though we like to think that they're very straightforward and we look at the application of a therapy versus the non-application of a therapy, essentially what we do is look at the application of a therapy versus increased application of all the other therapies available for traumatic brain injury. So, so this study was not a simple study looking at is hypothermia is the application of hypothermia good? But it was a comparison of the application of hypothermia to the increased application of hyperventilation, um, hi increased use of hyperosmotic therapy, and it becomes very difficult to dissect out benefit when you have those confounding variables. And so this led to, excuse me, uh, essentially, uh, this may give us some of the, the reason as to why all these previous pediatric traumatic brain injury randomized control trials have failed. There's essentially been one study actually out of here at Rady Children's Hospital of the University of California, which did show uh, with, class, with a class two uh, quality of evidence that intracranial pressure could be decreased with the use of hypertonic saline. But there were other articles which, which did not support this as well. And I think most of us at the bedside would agree that hypertonic saline is beneficial in the setting of refractory intracranial hypertension, but we just don't have the evidence to support it. So in, in summary, there's not a lot that I can leave the audience with, except that uh, you know, I think most of us in the field use the general guidelines of maintaining an intracranial pressure of less than 20, potentially even lower than that in infants, but less than 20 seems like a, a nice number for everybody to remember. A cerebral perfusion pressure somewhere um, above 50 to 60, brain tissue oxygenation above 25, and a PaCO2 of 32, avoid hypothermia, and then keep your hemoglobin up and reduce your coagulopathy.
But what, what Mike was going to spend a little bit more time than I, than I am this morning talking about is maybe the paradigm is wrong. It may be that our, our randomized control trials are not the right way of approaching this treatment because all other aspects of care are not identical um, outside of our interventions. And so what we end up doing is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. So we know what the questions are with respect to intracranial pressure management. We need to know if ICP is a rule linked to outcome. We need to know if CSF diversion is worth the risk. We need to know if hyperventilation is, is worth the concomitant ischemia associated with it. Um, we need to look at brain tissue oxygen monitoring, nutrition, glucose, and, and hyperosmolar fluids. But we, we need to look at all these together. And so what Mike is in the process of what ha, Mike has put together and is in the process of starting is a multi-medical therapy study, which will attempt to enroll over a thousand children, or up to a thousand children, in 32 sites internationally to look at some of these key questions that we're facing. So until this study, until the results of this study are available, which I think will be very exciting for all of us, we need to kind of stick to the physiological basics because we know that it does improve our, you know, it seems to improve our outcome somewhat, and the therapies make sense. But overall, uh, we have numerous failed multicenter trials with outcomes varying significantly by site. So we're, we're going to try a, a new direction in the field and essentially look at comparative effectiveness research um, to try to tease out some of these problems. Um, in the meantime, I would say avoid your steroids. Hypothermia is currently out, although who knows when it will resurface again. Um, I really can't give any intelligent advice with respect to, to diet and nutrition because we just don't know. And um, hypertonic or mannitol for your increased ICP may be leaning a little bit towards, towards hypertonic. Dr. Shellington, thank you so much. That was really a fantastic, uh, quick overview of a very complicated area. Uh, so thank you, and hopefully you can stay for the panel. Uh, we'd appreciate it very much. Uh, to segue now in, with Dr.